Hi, my name is Alan Shangerman, and I'm a junior at Marlboro High School in New Jersey. Today, I want to talk about something I find absolutely beautiful, and that is the ability for seemingly abstract mathematical concepts to be applied seamlessly to the sciences. My favorite example of this phenomenon is that of complex numbers, and their almost universal application to quantum mechanics. Now, a complex number is defined as a plus bi, where a and b are just real numbers, and i, also known as the imaginary number, is defined as the square root of negative 1, a quantity that mathematicians will never truly know the value of. The strange and counterintuitive idea that the square root of a negative number is even definable arose in the early 16th century. Mathematicians were trying to solve cubic equations and discovered these negative square roots as parts of their solutions. Most prominent mathematicians at the time dismissed these solutions as useless and having neither practical nor scholarly benefits. However, over the course of the next few centuries, the use of complex numbers became more popular, especially in regards to their geometric interpretation and their incredible similarity to vectors. Analysis of complex numbers soon became an important field, no pun intended, in mathematics. Trust me, I could talk about the history of complex numbers all day, but this is supposed to be a physics video. How in the world can this purely mathematical idea be used in analyzing properties of real life? Well, there are actually a few answers, but the one I really want to dive into is the use of complex numbers in quantum mechanics, the study of motion and interaction of particles at the atomic and subatomic levels. Quantum mechanics does not follow the fundamental principles established in classical mechanics, one being that if a particle is moving in one dimension, let's say in the x direction, if we can determine its position and momentum, we can use them to predict with certainty what the object's motion will be at some future moment in time. On the subatomic level, however, it's not so easy. From the brilliant work of one scientist named Heisenberg, no, not that one, this one, we know that we cannot know the position and momentum of a quantum particle at any time. In fact, there's a limit to the precision at which we can estimate it. This is called the uncertainty principle, which is mathematically denoted as this inequality. On the left-hand side, we have delta x multiplied by delta p, while delta x and p are values for uncertainty of position and momentum, respectively. We have that this quantity is greater than or equal to a constant, h-bar, the reduced Planck constant, which is commonly used in wave mechanics, divided by 2. What this model allows us to see is that the more we know about, let's say, position, the less we can know about momentum, and vice versa, creating an inverse relationship. This idea, coupled with another important principle that subatomic particles really don't act like particles, but act like a particle and a wave at the same time, a wave-particle duality, if you will, and that leads us to the wave function. The wave function, psi, of position of, and time, is a multivariable function that allows us to describe probabilities of behavior and motion of quantum particles. Analogous to how position and momentum allow us to examine motion of normal particles, but it throws out the laws of classical mechanics and introduces the quirky laws of quantum mechanics. The wave function cannot provide exact information about quantum particles due to that uncertainty principle, but what it can do is describe the probability of certain interactions to occur. Now, the wave function is not limited to a certain class of function. In fact, it can interestingly take the form of any continuous function that could be squared or integrated to give a finite result. The wave function is where we finally see complex numbers entering the world of physics, as it is an always complex valued function. The physical intuition for this strange occurrence lies in understanding the quantum behavior of a particle. To develop a good intuition of this, you'll need to think of particles as points on ropes. In classical mechanics, these ropes move up and down, and the particles move left and right along the ropes. 
This will create some sort of curved path for the particle. However, at the quantum level, the ropes begin to rotate as they would in a jump rope. So each particle's path becomes somewhat cyclical or circular in nature with some bends and kicks. If one has a good understanding of mathematics, the next logical step to define these paths nicely is the use of a polar coordinate system. Polar coordinates have magnitudes and angles denoted by r and theta, respectively, as opposed to the x and y values of Cartesian coordinates. Polar coordinates are related to these Cartesian coordinates with trigonometric functions. For example, x on the Cartesian plane is always equal to r, the magnitude, times cosine of theta, the angle, and y, similarly, is equal to r sine theta. We can define complex numbers x plus yi as r times the quantity cosine theta plus i sine theta using similar logic. Make sure you see why this is true. This is called the polar form of a complex number, and it could be very useful in analyzing cyclical motion. However, working with trigonometric functions is difficult. Luckily, one mathematician named Leonard Euler devised a fantastic way to relate complex numbers in polar form to exponentials with his identity e to the i theta is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta. Multiplying both sides by r gives us the polar form of a complex number on the right side. And on the left side, we have r times e to the i theta, a very compact and easy to work with form. Now, it would be possible to write all of the equations in quantum mechanics utilizing trigonometric functions, but it is far easier to work with exponentials when describing motion and interaction. Thus, scientists will always use them over the use of trigonometric functions. We see this in a simple, a word used relatively here, example in one dimension. We have the wave function psi of position and time is equal to a, just a constant, times e, the exponential, to the power of i times the quantity kx minus omega t, where omega is the angular frequency and k is a quantity called the wave number. Remember, you'll see that these subatomic objects have both particle and wave-like qualities. From this necessity of using complex numbers in the definition of the wave function, all of quantum mechanics uses i, a number once thought of to be a mathematical fallacy. Here are some of the foundational equations in quantum mechanics. The Schrodinger equation, a quantum analog of Newton's second law, albeit far more complex. This monstrous function allows physicists to make predictions about particle behavior, all of which would be impossible without the brilliant use of complex numbers. Schrodinger's equation, while quite daunting, epitomizes the beauty found in quantum mechanics. You don't have to understand the complex equations with partial differentiation and convoluted matrix operations to understand my essential point. In your math classes, I'm sure you have already encountered concepts that are difficult to comprehend and seem to be incompatible with real life. For many people, this is a barrier that destroys any interest in math and science and sometimes even causes a hatred of the subjects. I hope that this beautiful application of complex numbers to physics has showed you that even the most obscure topics in math can be infinitely interesting and applicable to the most fundamental concepts of the universe. When math and science get hard, don't give up. Persevere and you'll find that not only can you handle the material, but also that you'll derive an immense satisfaction from learning new things, and you'll begin to truly appreciate the complexity of our world. Thanks for watching.